Ah, we here we go, ladies and gentlemen. It's another fine, wonderful night here on the Paranormal Portal. And it's Friday, so that's always a good thing, right? Um, everybody loves a Friday. Y'all been working for the weekend. It's now here. Hope you guys have a big weekend ahead of you, but thank you so much for coming in and spending at least part of it here with me. Uh, we'll be doing this tomorrow night as well. Hopefully I'll have Jimmy with me tomorrow night. Uh, hopefully he'll be available and we can tear it all up again. But I'm not alone tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I am joined by, what can I say, the big branch of my personal family tree. Mr. Sheldon Thomas is here. How you doing, buddy? I'm doing amazing. And hopefully everyone out there is doing amazing, too. Thank you for joining us. And on this wonderful Friday night, how are you doing? I'm doing good. It's a beautiful day here. It was actually in into the 60 range, so it was uh, exciting because, uh, you know, I can see my shorts and T-shirt coming with my flip-flops. It's in the near future. <laughs> That's my happy place, as you well know. It is. It really is. Yeah, so anyway, we got a lot to get to tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as we dive into the the uh, underbelly of the paranormal, if you will. <laughs> I don't know if there's an overbelly or a back of it, but uh, yeah, we're going to dive into all of it tonight and see what we can get to. Uh, the man, the myth, the legend, Sheldon. Yeah, absolutely, John. John Stevenson, Melissa Cronenwetters. Cronenwetters here. Good mm -hmm. to see you, Melissa. 49 degrees here in Cincinnati. That's, that's I mean, it's... That's Mel pretty good. It's not snowing. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's my take on it. You know, it's like, yeah, I know it's not balmy weather yet, but it's not snowing. And actually, we saw the sun today because up here in the inland Pacific Northwest, we don't see a lot of sun until about uh, maybe April. Uh, but we had, uh, it looks like the whole weekend is going to be beautiful. So uh, it's looking good. I know it's the third worst place to be. If that's your favorite place, Brent, <laughs> um, I, I guess maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, it's okay up here. I, I don't mind it in the summer months. It's really extraordinarily beautiful. It's just the winters. I just, I've just kind of aged out of that. You know, I, my, my, <laughs> I've, I've gone over the plateau of like, Hey, let's go skiing. <laughs> it's like, no, <laughs> that's not happening. I used to do that all the time. I used to ski and, uh, any, you know, if I could get out in snowmobiles, like if I knew somebody that had some, we'd go out snowmobile in it. Things like that. I liked, but, uh, yeah, those, those windows have long <laughs> closed and, uh, I just pretty much stay inside for three months of the year as much as I can anyway. Uh, but anyway, enough of the weather. You're not here to listen to me whine about the weather, although I was uh, feeling optimistic. But uh, good to see you all. Thank you all for coming in. We got Weapon X5. Came in first. Came in first. Also, just a little bit of news, ladies and gentlemen. If you're not already a member of our Discord, please become a member. Uh, Sheldon, would you mind popping a link up there? Of course. Um, because, uh, not only because it's a great place to, you know, have continuing conversations about all this craziness that is the paranormal. But I, I, every month we do a t-shirt giveaway and I just announced today the next, you know, entry period. So if you want to enter, there's a thread on there on our discord called giveaways. And we'd love to see you get involved over there and uh, maybe win yourself a shirt. I'm just saying paranormal portal shirts uh, at that. So it's not just some, some Walmart shelf item. It's a, uh, <laughs> you know, keep on trucking or hang in there with a kitten hanging on a branch. <laughs> Nothing like that. It actually says Paranormal Portal on it. So you'll be sporting that's the right. coolest logo in all of Paranormal. So that's all that's I'm right. saying. Mm -hmm. uh, Batman, good to see you. Chris Sirk is here. Uh, Wizard Moon. Cool Hand, that's a new name to me. Cool Hand, nice to meet you. Thanks for coming in. Sorry if you've been here before. I just, I, I don't know. It seems familiar, but then again, it's like, well, I've seen a lot of names through the years. So if I'm, if I'm, misrepresenting you oh brian gaska how you doing brother it's been a long time man good to see you glad to see you showed up um lucky gypsy of course is manning twitch and the youtube chat so thank you for that lucky gypsy i appreciate it and uh sheldon's actually uh keeping an eye on rumble if you're not already aware we're now streaming live to youtube to twitch and to rumble there's three locations to watch the shows um i haven't modded anybody yet over in rumble but I'm going to learn how to do that and make that happen as well. Um, but if you're a Rumble user, then please find the channel over there and subscribe and check it out. That's all That's I'm right. saying. Check it out. All right. Um, 
I guess we should probably dive into some news, Sheldon. You feel like you, you need some news? No, just kidding. Yes, of course. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for joining us, Sheldon. Oh, I'm sorry, we're going to lose your connection. Um, yeah, we're going to get to the news. Eric Frey's in here, or Fry. Good to see you, brother. Uh, who? Deb Varner's here. Hi, Deb. Hey, Deb. Good to see you, Deb. Deb's our paranormal portal psychic. She joins us when we have phone lines so we can do uh, psychic readings. So if, you, if you're ever into, you know, got a hankering for a private reading, reach out to Deb. She's uh, amazing, absolutely amazing, and we love her dearly. Yes. She's been a part of the family forever here mm-hmm. on the portal. I mean, years and years. So, uh, she, and she, she's still putting up with us. <laughs> so we must be doing something right. But anyway, let's dig into it. Only independent news. Oops. That was the inner voice. It is oh. independent. It's the paranormal portal news, Melissa. And, uh, let's get to that right now. It's time, ladies and gentlemen, for the news. Sheldon, you're so lucky. You're so lucky, Sheldon. You're sitting there bobbing your head like yeah. this. And I was like, oh. And I was trying to quick pop your camera up onto the, onto the so people could see you bopping along with it. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> I couldn't get it done in time, though. I was, I was sitting there like, oh, 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 oh. Uh, <laughs> this is like hot potato. But anyway, oh it's good to see you enjoying that theme music, that, uh, that, that, that transition screen you just watched, that little video. It was courtesy of Mr. Wes Germer of Sasquatch Chronicles. He so, does an amazing job. And sometimes he throws us some bones like that, so uh, that's pretty cool. He did a nice job. So anyway, join the, the boppers. <laughs> What's the, the bop- boppers? What's the boppers, Maggie? I don't even know what the boppers are, but it uh, makes me want to join. because I'm part of their club. They yeah, sound I'm delicious. <laughs> oh, wait, I'm thinking of jalapeno poppers. Never mind. <laughs> ah, see what I did there? Thank you. I'm here all night. All right, it's time, ladies and gentlemen, for the Paranormal Portal News, and I'm your anchor, Brent Thomas, along with my co-anchor, Sheldon, and we're going to dig into some uh, news articles that I hope you find informative and uh, intriguing and leave you uh, in an all-around better place than when you came in. At least that's my my wish for every show. I'm not sure we always hit that, but anyway... The first article up tonight comes from a, an amazing site. And, and throughout the show, you're going to hear me mention a lot of sites. And please, please, please go visit these sites. It really helps to support what they're doing. It helps to keep them on the air, keep them broadcasting what, what it is they're doing. Because a lot of these sites are being run by people who are doing it on their own blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, it's not cheap to host a site. You have to, you know, host a, you know, material. You have to keep it relevant and timely. You've got to pay for bandwidth. So by visiting these sites, you're giving them revenue, which helps them keep the lights on. And I love this site. This is unexplained-mysteries.com. So please check them out. And uh, they bring us the articles tonight that we're going to go through on the news. The first one is coming from the metaphysics and psychology category. And this is com- comedian Bob Mortimer. And I'm not sure who that is. I, I don't recognize that name at all, but apparently he's a comedian, but he recalls white light during near-death experience. Yay, yay, yay. Now, wonder if he wonder if he came out of that psychic. A lot of people that experience near-death experiences can come out of it with like enhanced psychic awareness. So it's interesting. Mm. Anyway, the popular popular British comedian experienced something profound while undergoing heart surgery. Oof. Yeah, that's not the kind of place you want to start entering white lights. <laughs> Just saying. Mm. Best known for his wacky brand of comedy and his double act with fellow British comedian Rick, Vic Reeves, the 64-year-old is something of a household name in the UK. Back in 2015, he was told by doctors that his arteries were almost completely blocked and he was going to need extensive surgery in the form of a triple heart bypass to address the issue. The prospect of undergoing the operation obviously had a profound impact on him as he made the decision to marry his girlfriend of 22 years. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, get 
get on that horse, you know? It's like, <laughs> wow, dragging that poor girl for 22 years? Come on, make a commitment, brother. Uh, <laughs> just saying. Lisa Matthews, on the day of his admission to the hospital, <laughs> case I don't wake up, you're mine. Uh, <laughs> that's it. Way to give her the best years of your life, buddy. Um, on the day of the admission to the hospital. Then, while undergoing the surgery, he had a near-death experience. Speaking uh, recently on Kathy Burke's Where There's a Will, There's a Wake. <laughs> That's horrible. Wait, whoa. Where there's whoa. a will, there's a wake. Whoa. <laughs> That's a little dark. <laughs> I think he came back, though. He, I don't think he stayed dead, so I'm not sure he qualified for that show. But anyway, let's check it out. There's a will, there's a wake. He described witnessing a tunnel and a light as well as feelings of peace and happiness. Uh, I did see the light at the end of the tunnel, he said, and I experienced going towards the light and feeling happier than I've ever felt ever. It was quite extraordinary. And then I woke up a day later and I was, okay, I thought, this is great. I no longer fear death and everything. Later, however, he received a number of letters from people who tried to convince him that his experience had a physical rather than metaphysical explanation. Yeah, the DMT dump and all that. And loads of people wrote to me and said, it's because your body gives out loads of PCT and some chemical to get you through that and gives you these hallucinations. He said, I was a bit sad about that. Yeah, no kidding. It's like, hey, I'm going to steal that beauty from you and make it creepy. Yeah. yeah. God bless people in their, in their uh, I don't know, like their, <laughs> if their IQ were 10 points lower, they'd be a rock. <laughs> Jeez. It's like, yeah, I'm, I, I don't believe what you experienced is what you experienced because I don't believe in that. So this is what you experienced. Screw it's, those people. It's like someone, someone, being, someone feeling really happy about something. It's like, well, actually, what you're feeling really happy about shouldn't be really, being really felt happy about. You know, it's, it's taken away that happiness that you feel about something. Right, and right. It's in poor taste. Hey, we got a couple viewers over on Rumble. We got Aussie Tigers over there and Paranormal Boone. Nice to meet you. Paranormal Boone, thanks for checking it out on Rumble. We're kind of brand new to Rumble, so this is uh, an exciting day. So, Paranormal Boone is me. Oh. <laughs> you want to tell me there's no life after death too, Sheldon? Jesus. <laughs> God, you just killed it. Should have kept it to myself. You're right. I was just one of those people. I was, right. getting, I was getting all excited. Like, hey, somebody found us. <laughs> In other news, <laughs> I understand those people now. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> it makes perfect sense now. Yeah, you suck. All right. Anyway, let's get get to the next news article. Now that I'm absolutely deflated. All right, let's get to the next one. Ah, uh, and this is uh, also from unexplained-mysteries.com, and uh, this one is. Um. Oh yeah, this one's gonna be good. This is creepy, though. It's kind of creepy. And I don't know. I mean, I guess it's bound to happen with thousands and thousands of years of history and uh, horrors happening all over. Wherever there's land, some kind of tragedies probably occurred, which is <laughs> not the most smiley, sunshiny thing I've ever said. But it's kind of the truth. Like, lots of good things have probably happened on a lot of land, too. But um, this one is coming from the Modern Mysteries uh, category on unexplained-mysteries.com. And this is workers discover three human skulls while laying foundation for a new home. Oh. Whoa. oh. <laughs> Wonder what happened to the last home. <laughs> yeah, that's not a good sign. Yeah. Did you see the movie Poltergeist, Sheldon? A long time ago, but yes. Yeah, yeah. You didn't move the graves, you just moved the tombstones. <laughs> The, the, the caskets are popping out of the in-ground pool that they're digging. It's oh. all full of water. Oh. It's, and this whole place is absolutely haunted. Yeah, so that's what I'm thinking. Anyway, the grisly discovery was made by construction crews working at a building site in Naramson Road, New Jersey. The find, which was made on Tuesday, consists of what were thought to be the skulls and skeletal remains of three people who had been interred beneath a property at the site. It was pretty clear from the outset that what the crew had found were human remains. 
They were digging for a new foundation, and we encountered actually three skulls and a lot of bones, said paving company owner Bob Wiley, who also noted that one skull was smaller than the others. Oof, that's, that's tragic. Mm. It appeared from the proximity of the remains that the skeletons had been buried together. The building site was promptly shut down so that police officers could conduct an investigation. And since then, speculation has been rife over who the mysterious victims could be. Some have suggested that the workers may, be, may have found a Native American burial ground, while others had put forward the possibility that skeletons are those of a serial killer's victims. Others, again, maintain that the discovery could be some sort of family burial plot. It will be critical for authorities to first determine if the deaths were recent or historical. It would be immensely improper for our office or the Wall Township Police Department to provide further information or details at this time, given the need for further forensic analysis, said Ma Ma Monmouth, Monmouth County Prosecutor Raymond S. Santiago. Wow. And there it is. There's a drone view of the building site. You know, I'm, I'm betting it's probably just a family plot that was, you know, it wasn't uncommon in the day to just, in, you know, inter people that died in your household on your property. You know, it was probably a family property. But anyway, time will tell. I don't know how old they were. They don't say. So it's anybody's guess, folks. But that's got to be a horrible thing to find if you're <laughs> digging a foundation. It's like, mm -hmm. And I'm sure it moves back the building uh, process a little bit. Oh, probably. I wonder, yeah, if there's, wonder if there's more. We think they'll find more. What if they found like 40 others? Mm -hmm. Oh. Start with holy water. That's where you begin with that one, I think. I mean, you never know what's under the ground until you start digging. That's true. Oh, that's an ad. Almost popped Whoa. an ad on us. <laughs> I almost did it, but I saved it. All right. Let's get to the next one. Because, wait, there's more in the Paranormal Portal news this one's kind of weird. I don't know. This is, I don't think this is such a big deal, but apparently it's a big deal. I, I didn't know uh, all about it. I actually pre-read this one because I was like, what? And when I pulled it up, I was like, I got to understand what this is. So uh, from unexplained-mysteries.com, ladies and gentlemen, the next article is man guilty of using cloned animal parts to create giant Franken sheep. <laughs> Ah, he's making Franken sheep, Sheldon. What the hell? Imagine the quilt you can get out of that. The 80 year old had been attempting to create enormous hybrid animals for hunters to shoot on his property. What? Boy, isn't that a motivator? Isn't that a great motivator? <laughs> Can't wait till they bring mammoths back and have the. <laughs> All right, kids, pack up your rifles. We're going to the mammoth farm. <laughs> It's just an elephant with, with fur. <laughs> it got it. glued, <laughs> glued fur blankets on it. You know what you need? It's really a mammoth. Uh, <laughs> the elaborate scheme, which was inventive and clever, as it was told, totally legal, was cooked up by Arthur Jack. What did you get Jack out of Arthur? Anyway, <laughs> Shoebarth, maybe his middle name is James or whatever. The yeah. octogenarian owner of an alternate livestock ranch in Montana. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, in 2013, Shubarth had begun an elaborate scheme to produce gargantuan hybrid sheep by illegally importing the biological tissue of the Marco Polo sheep, the largest sheep species found anywhere in the world. Native to the mountainous regions of Central Asia, these huge sheep can weigh up to 300 pounds and have horns that grow up to 5 feet wide, making them a prime target for wealthy trophy hunters. The decade-long endeavor involved smuggling tissue into the U.S. and then sending it to a laboratory where over 150 cloned embryos were created. Schubart then implanted the embryos in use on his ranch, resulting in a single pure genetic male Marco Polo, Argale, Ar Argali, that he named Montana Mountain King, or MMK, the authorities wrote. And he then proceeded to artificially impregnate his female sheep to create a new hybrid species. The new gigantic Franken sheep could then be used to provide a sport for trophy hunters. They'd all been going, it had all been going according to plan until it was caught by the authorities. 
This is an audacious scheme to create massive hybrid sheep species to be sold and hunted as trophies, said Assistant Attorney General Todd Kim from the Justice Department's Environment and Natural Resources Division. In pursuit of this scheme, Schubarth violated international law and the Lacey Act, both of which protect the viability and health of native populations of animals. The guilty party could now face five years in prison and a fine of up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Wow. He's just trying to do some trophy hunting. Maybe he really likes sheep. <laughs> I don't know. Five years in prison, though. I guess I. You know, I mean, I don't know what the Lacey Act is, but I, I imagine that has to do with transporting international genetic materials for, you know, cloning purposes or whatever. Now, I I wonder if also. The labs that process that material and created viable embryos are also in some deep crap on this, you know? Because you'd think they'd have to make sure. That, are you sure this is legal, Jack? <laughs> oh, come yeah. on, I'll bring you a beer. Sure. All right. Well, there you I, go. I'm actually with Batman on this. I don't see it as a big deal. I didn't really either, and, and I don't know. Because here's the thing. The fact that we have dogs from the size of small horses all the way down to they'll you know, fit in your pocket is the result of selective breeding, yep. you know, and, and God, I mean, that's nothing new in the face of our world. I mean, selective breeding has been using for used forever. Now he wasn't able to bring one of the actual Marco Polo sheep, but he brought the material in order to make one and came up with a viable hundred percent purebred and then just used it to breed his other sheep, which were probably already selectively bred to be pretty pretty huge. And I don't know. I mean, is that a big deal? I don't know. It's not like they say they say in pursuit of the scheme, um, it's it's both of which protect the viability and health of native populations of animals. Well, it's not like he was letting them go in the wild and just say, Go be free. Um, he was just keeping them on his ranch. <laughs> So I don't. It doesn't matter to me either. I I don't disagree with what you're saying, Batman. I I, I think you're you're kind of right. I don't understand, but it's just what it is. Uh, maybe is just another flex by our big brother. I don't know. I, oh, I, here's some added added context coming in for Barbara Mora. The Lacey oh. Act of 1900 is a conservation law in the United States that prohibits. Trade in wildlife, fish, and plants that have been illegally taken, possessed, or transported, or sold. Oh, okay. So there's there could be more to this story, honestly, than we're even reading. It's possible, at least. <laughs> Batman says he must have got tired of holding ge genetic material in his mouth, going through customs. <laughs> What's in your lip, chew? <laughs> Tobacco! <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That's gross. Hi, Christy. Good to see you. Christy Sci-Fi, great to see you. Oh. Been a long time. Yeah, um, yeah, I haven't seen that name in a while, too. It's always good to see people come back. Glad you remembered we're out there. <laughs> he says gross. <laughs> <laughs> it's an old law, Philip Blair says. Okay. Yeah, I'm, hell, I don't know. But again, you know, selective breeding has been used forever. Although, you know, I mean, that's why we got dogs instead of wolves. It's almost hypocritical, like, oh, so we can selectively breed when it's convenient for you, but when it's not convenient, then it's <laughs> yeah, no kidding. And then you hear the stories about the, the dogman soldiers that were created by the government. It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. I don't think that's oh. right. Right? Government, be, government being hypocrites? Wait, that's a new thing? Rules for thee and not for me. I think that's how it goes, right? Yes. I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, God only knows. <laughs> I think there was a pandemic that was kind of not necessarily legal either. Um, Never forget Ruby Ridge. Ruby Ridge. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't forget that. That's a horrible tragedy. That was right up in these neck of the woods. Oh, it was in Idaho. Yeah, I think so. Yep. Oh. Up in my area. All right, so let's continue. Okay. All right, let me... Uh, let me close this. All right. I had to remember what I'm doing. Kind of had a little, uh, oh, wait, you know what? That was it. That's the news, folks. Wow. <laughs> there it is. I was like, well, and I, I thought there was one more, but no. Oh, that's that one I'll save for tomorrow. 
That one I'll save for tomorrow. There's another one here, but I'm going to save it for tomorrow's show. Because uh, if Jimmy doesn't join me, it's going to be just me, and I need material. <laughs> All right, so um, that's been the news, folks. Hopefully, hopefully you found this uh, wonderfully engaging and informative, and you feel like it's made you a more complete person. And if so, you're welcome. But at least I hope you left the news learning something you didn't know before. All right, let's get back at it and find out what else I got in store for you, because sometimes I don't even know. News, Maggie says. <laughs> Sam. All right. Sam says, are you are you guys making fun of me or is there really a Jimmy? <laughs> I must say though, I love this group. No, there's a his name is Jimmy Cipriano. He comes on on Saturdays and joins me as my co-host. So if you tune in tomorrow, if he's available, he'll be in Sheldon's position. So that's right. That's right. Nope, there is a Jimmy. So there was nothing. We weren't digging at all. Yeah, it's just saying it like it is. All right. That's right. So Sheldon. Yes. What's going on in, in uh, Minnesota? Any cryptids going on there? I don't know. Are there? <laughs> As there there's a website we can look for that, actually. No, I know there is. Um, I actually have an article pulled up. And this one this one I kind of pulled up because I thought, well, this is interesting. Now, I don't know. Many of you out there have probably heard of the Aztec death whistles. And they're these <laughs> horrible sounding things that you blow into and it sounds like Sounds like a woman screaming terribly, like you know, a horrible scream. And I'm not sure what they were for. Actually can change brown chicken, brown cow to bop it along. And that'll get rid of the, I don't know. That's It's like an ear mag. It's, I can just always hear it every time that theme goes. I love Jimmy. I can't wait for tomorrow night. I hope that I don't get sidetracked. Yeah, I hope you don't either, Sam. You, you know, you're kind of, you're kind of on the hook now since... You put it out there. You better he be here. I'm going to be taking attendance. So. That's right. <laughs> Hate to have to mark your absence. Just saying. Worm cryptids. Yeah, worm cryptids. But the Aztec death whistle, whistle is also rearing its head in paranormal research. Uh, people are just blowing it. Sometimes in Bigfoot's, uh, you know, dogman cryptid research. Sometimes in ghosts and haunting research. Just because it's something so different and may elicit some kind of response. Now, I can see that being maybe effective in the woods. My God, I, I think that uh, with the cryptids and such, I think they are at least mm, at least marginally, but if not aggressively territorial. So if it sounds like something else is moving into their turf and they don't know what the hell it is, I think you know something like that could get a response. Now, with spirits, I don't know. I don't know if that kind of stuff would have a reaction from them just uh you know if that would elicit a response or or at least more activity or not but <clears throat> at this point everything's fair game you know i mean if you want to launch fireworks in the woods to try to draw bigfoot that's a great idea you know some kind of battery operated light show great idea you know just something to look interesting because i think the key is with a lot of this research is you know uh, if and especially if it's haunted areas or well-researched uh, Bigfoot areas, they get kind of played out. I think, and, and I can't, I can't tell you this is true or not, but I, you know, I've been to uh, a few pretty haunted locations and one of the most famous ones I was at, which was St. Ignatius. That was just billed as this really, you know, really active place. And I went there with Charles Howard Johnson and, and he'd been there several times and he had a lot of different activity through the course of his visits there. But the night we went, and that's the paranormal. You can't schedule this stuff. It just happens when it happens. But I know that when I went there, it was near Halloween last year. And it was, yeah, leading up to Halloween. And they had been scheduled every night for uh, at least a month or, or so prior to Halloween, having tours come through and groups coming through and doing research 
And the night we were there, it was very quiet. We had a few anomalous things happen. Um, I'm pretty sure they were around. I, I could, you could feel that vibe that you weren't alone. They just weren't really going out of their way to interact. And, and so perhaps by bringing in new things like that, you can elicit more responses or like, Hey, I've never heard that before. What the hell was that? Let's go check it out. And maybe that would do it. So, but I found this article from curiosmos.com. And this is the story behind the disturbing ancient Aztec death whistle. And I don't, it's written by Valentin Chukwu or Chukwu. And it's from September 2nd, 2020. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I've never really heard the backstory or, or much information on this death whistle other than they found them in, you know, excavating Aztec ruins and stuff. And so that's very interesting. I think, you know, maybe they know what they use them for, but let's see what the article says and we'll go through it together. So. Again, this is Curios, Curiosmos, Curiosmos. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but it's Curious and then Mos, M-O-S. So this is the article. The story behind the disturbing ancient Aztec death whistle. Sheldon, you ever heard one of these? I think I did once, but isn't it kind of screechy? Yeah, I'll find a sound bite and play it for you. Yeah. Aztec death whistle sound. They're, they're horrible. <laughs> I'm just going to say yeah. that. They are absolutely horrible sounding. Uh, and I mean horrible, like the capital H. They, they, sounds like hey, friends. Oh, who God. wants to say Hold with on. me? Are Wait, you let me, let me mute that. Oh. It won't even let me skip that. Here we go. Uh, this is from the channel First 508th Airborne. He's got 288,000 subscribers. Here he goes. Oh, wait, he's not going yet. But let me put it on screen here. Hold on. Um, it looks like he's just about to blow it. I think I know who you're talking about, actually. Oh, really? I think he lives in Minnesota, actually. Is he Minnesota? Okay, well, he's bald, has a beard. Does that sound like the guy? Yeah, it does. Okay, well, you're going to see him right now. Yep. Oh, that's him. Yep. Yep, okay. So let's hear what this sounds like. I, I don't have, you know, his permission to air this, but as far as just, it's a minute 26. Um, I, I will just play the part. Where he's blowing in it, I'm not trying to rip him off. So, on first 508th Airborne, my deepest respect to you, and I hope you don't mind. All right, he's talking about it. He's holding it, and yeah, it's got a hole. It looks like a skull, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's talking a little bit about it, and I haven't watched this video. I just literally just Googled it now. But we'll see what he says here, or what, what the sound is. When we get to that, I'm not there yet. So let me just see if I can go ahead. Uh, maybe you're out here. Okay, give it a blow, brother. Let's hear this thing. And this is for all of you. If you've never heard this sound before, you know why they call it a death whistle. There you go. That's an Aztec death whistle. And they make them in different... What the hell happened? They make them in different sizes. My headphones just went out. That was weird. <laughs> could you hear me? Yeah, I could, we could hear you. Okay. <laughs> That's weird. <laughs> Everything just went dead. I was like, what? That I can't. is haunting sound. Though. Right? Oh, my God. Yeah, so that's an Aztec death whistle. So when I found this article, it's like, you know, I've been hearing a lot about these for the last couple of years. And um, I never really knew the story, so let's find out together. Now you know what they sound like, thanks to Aztec Death Whistle video on First 508th Airborne uh, YouTube channel. Thank you for that. And let's get to it and find out what the story is. It says, the, a the Aztec Death Whistle was a powerful yet scary artifact used both in Aztec warfare and religious ceremonies across the Aztec Empire. The Aztec death whistle, a skull-shaped artifact, was not merely a chilling curiosity, and it's believed, it's believed use, used in psychological warfare, and its ghost-like sounds made it an object of profound intrigue. Unearthed from an Aztec temple dedicated to the wind god Ihecatl, uh, in Mexico, excuse me, this particular item was thought initially thought to be a simple ornament, 
Only later did archaeologists realize the significant role it may have played in Aztec society. More than meets the eye, the whistle's terrifying purpose, and this is years after its discovery, experts proposed that the Aztec death whistle was more than a trinket. It could have been a tool of terror used in sacrifices, ceremonies, and battles to strike fear into the hearts of enemies. Found in the grip of the dead, the Mayan, Aztec, Inca, Andean, and other Mesoamerican cultures were known for crafting intricate wind instruments such as flutes, whistles, and aerophones from clay, bone, stone, and metal, often used in sacred rituals. The death whistle was found in the hands of a 20-year-old man buried at the temple of Iacatl, each hand clutching a skull-shaped whistle. Guiding, uh, the Aztecs used the death whistle as an essential tool in their rites, including sacrifices and funerals. As per some experts, the eerie sound of the whistle accompanied, by, accompanied the killing of a sacrifice, guiding the victim's soul into the afterlife, symbolizing the lord of the night wind escorting the soul away. The death whistle produced its ghostly sound when air flows into its cavity, causing pressure fluctuations to generate the sound. One simply blows into the mouthpiece. The air then enters the whistle, altering pressure and creating various sounds from animal-like growls to chilling shrieks as it vibrates within the whistle's chaos chamber before exiting the bottom. The Aztec death whistle was believed to be a formidable psychological warfare tool, the Aztecs' legendary warriors would conceal themselves in dense jungles, blowing the whistle before launching an attack, using its harrowing sound to instill fear and unsettle their enemies. Wow. Psychological warfare, even back then. That's crazy. No kidding. Yeah, beyond warfare, the Aztec death whistle had a softer side. Aztec legends recount its use in therapy with the belief that the whistle's hypnotic sound. Hypnotic? Seriously? <laughs> oh, my God. It puts me into a trance. <laughs> soothing environment? Yeah, it could create a soothing what? environment conducive to overcoming illness. <laughs> yeah, it'll scare the hell out of you. Even illness. <laughs> I love to hear the screams of victims. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's like... Conan the Barbarian's, uh, you know, halftime whistle. <laughs> I'm blowing the souls of the dead. Wait, that didn't sound right at all. Never mind. <laughs> I meant this one. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that came out all wrong. Jesus. <laughs> if you didn't know, ladies and gentlemen, the show is absolutely unscripted, so you're getting it as it comes out of my noise hole. So oh, yeah. there's not much of a filter involved, unfortunately. <laughs> Dad's death whistle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mine has more bass. <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying. All right. So there you have it, folks. Now you know a little bit more about the Aztec death whistle and how it's, you know, entering into modern uh, paranormal research, I guess. I was, you know, I, again, I think it's, it's a great approach. I think the more unique things you can try, the more interesting that becomes to these beings, whether they're spiritual or physical, uh, because it's just stimulating a different response. You know, it's something they may not have heard. I don't know. Maybe they've heard that sound a bunch. <laughs> they're cryptids and ghosts. Who knows? It sounds like a woman screaming, right? Doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it does. That's exactly what it sounds like to me. I wonder if they can make a really bassy one like, you know, I don't know. Maybe. 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 Who knows? But anyway, that's the Aztec death whistle. Now you know a little bit more about it. <laughs> what I miss. What I miss. Batman's comments. What is it? I have an American death trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Batman, how you enrich this whole experience. <laughs> <laughs> Try singing Barbershop Quartet. Yeah, it's like the, like an old-time jug band, like, whoo, whoo, whoo. <laughs> <laughs> That'll curl your hair. Oh like a haka, I think, like an intimidation thing. Yeah, it sounds like it, Maggie. Mm -hmm. What are those things that the, the aboriginals would wave around? They look like a like a single propeller. But they sound cool as hell when they whip around. It's like, whoa, whoa. No, no, not the didgeridoo. 
I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about that that single blade that vibrates and it just creates this really cool sound. Mm. I, I, I only saw it from Crocodile Dundee, but I was like, God, that is cool. That's a neat sound. But any, uh, uh, Maggie, do you know what I'm talking about? Is that a whoop stick? I don't know. It's just, it's on a string. It's on like a, a rope. And, and it's a, like, looks like a single propeller, like a single propeller from a, from an aer- airplane. Mm-hmm. And, and they just whip it around and it vibrates as it, you know, as it's going around, they're whipping it around over their head. So, uh, mm. I know it's a telephone, th- but I'll find out. Oh, okay. So it was used to communicate. I know what you're talking about, Brent. And they are weird. Yeah. I'm going to find that out. I'm going to look now because I'm curious as hell. I can't remember. Yeah. I don't think I ever maybe knew what they were called. What is the aboriginal no tool on a string? A string that is used to call. Uh, that is that is spun in the air. Making a weird sound. I don't know if Google's going to know what to do with this sound. Um, the bull roarer, rhombus or turndun, is an ancient ritual musical instrument and a device historically used for communicating over great distances. It consists of a piece of wood attached to a string, which, when swung in a large circle, circle produces a roaring vibration sound. Okay, well, I want to hear that now. Yeah, um, the example. 244. I'm looking for a small clip. Here's a 1 minute 43. Let's see what this sounds like. I'm, I'm just going to mute it until he starts spinning. Whoops, not that. I don't want to hear the mm-hmm. ad. <laughs> I'm just sharing this because this, again, is another thing that it might be cool to try encrypted research because it's just such a unique sound that maybe it would bring him in. Like, what the hell does that sound? Okay, Bull Roarer. This is by Corwin Broke. B-R-O-C-H, and it's the Kate Corwin channel, 3.93, and he's talking about it. I just want to see him swing it, or he, her swing it. No, it's a him. He looked like a her until they panned out, and it looks like some guy out of v- Victorian England or something. Hmm. He's got, well, I know, he looks like he could be a three musketeer, actually. He's oh, dressed kind of like that, that too. Okay. Yeah. Okay, just start spinning it. There it is. Oh, wow. Isn't that kind of cool? Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like an engine. Right, it really does. It sounds like a like an airplane kind of revving up, really. Yeah. There it is. So, very cool. Now you know what that is. The bull roarer, or what did they say it was? The bull roarer, rhombus, or turndun. Bull roarer. Bull roarer. I don't know how to say that any better than that. <laughs> it just all comes out clunky in my mouth. Bull roarer. Bull roarer. <laughs> bull roarer. Is that better? Yes. Okay. I'll keep working on it. All right. It's Not that it's ever roarer. gonna come up again. Uh, in the in the eight years I've been doing the show, I've never <laughs> said that word before. Oh, but. it's like bull roarer. I yeah. See. Yeah. But ro- rhombus or turndun is a different, that sounds like turndun might be the Aboriginal word for it. But anyway, hmm. rhombus okay. could be too, I guess. I don't know. That sounds like a scientific thing though, doesn't it? Rhombus? I don't rhombus know. Rhombus is a shape, I believe. Well, there you go. That's That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that. I, that, that, that strikes true. I, I mean, <laughs> I recognize that now that you said that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So anyway. That's that. That's a little bit of, I don't know, side information. But I think things like that could be really powerful when you're doing research for, you know, uh, what might be a a native species that remains undiscovered. Well, maybe you just got to make it interesting. Either that or scare them all the hell away. Be like, I don't know what that is. And they they run and flee. (laughs) But the alternative, and, and I'm gauging this on interviews I've done with people that have experienced Bigfoot, but... One one gentleman, Todd Neese, uh, who, if you're into Bigfoot, you probably recognize his name. Uh, we had him on the on the sh- on the podcast and on the show, and he talked about being in a demolition crew in the in the National Guard, and he was uh, uh, they were doing some detonations, just test detonations and stuff, and uh, 
they detonated in one area and then drove to the next area, detonated that. When they came back, there were two Bigfoot standing right by where they detonated the last one. And only two of them saw it because it was on a side road. And they happened to be looking over and they both looked at each other like, oh, my God. Yeah. So kind of cool stuff. Um, but, I, you know, which is a, is a, a, it's an intelligent response because you think if something's exploding, everybody's natural, you know, instinct is to get the hell away. But yeah. these these things were like, what the hell was that? <laughs> you know? And so they came and checked it out. Very interesting. I mean, then again, if you've never heard what an explosion was, depending on where this was and their environments growing up and yeah, I don't moving know. along, maybe they never heard such a big explosion. Like, oh. Yeah, exactly. That? Yep, exactly. I know there's a video of some, some guy was out shooting with his, like, 12-year-old son. And they start out with a 22. And they're plucking away at this target and stuff. And, uh, and you can see on the hillside, just off in the distance, maybe... 80 yards to 100 yards away, mm -hmm. stealthily walking from bush to bush as they're shooting the 22 is, is what looks like a Bigfoot. It looks like this big hairy creature just kind of sneaking along, kind of checking out what they're doing, you know, getting, a, getting an idea of what's going on. And then they whip out the 12-gauge. And the first shot in this thing just bolts. You know, it's just like, Nyeh! you know, it takes <laughs> off. But it was like the curiosity brought it in. Like, what's that snapping sound? You know, so... Oh God! Yeah, twelve. They're so loud. Yeah, yeah twelve gauge is a way bigger noise than a twenty-two. So anyway, cool stuff. All right, let's uh, take a look at the time. Yeah, we're about at you know about at eight o'clock. So I guess we can head into the cryptid corner. Since we've been talking about creatures, Maybe I guess well. it's a fair segue, right, Sheldon? That's a good segue. All right. Well, we're gonna segue right into some uh, Bigfoot and other goodness. In the Cryptid Corner. Lon Strickler has a book on Audible now, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yep. Lon's, uh, Lon's a longtime friend of the show. And as you know, Philip, I'm sure, because you're a longtime friend of the show yourself. But <laughs> he's been on a few times, and i got to get him on again. Lon's great to talk to. But, um, yeah, he's got several books out there. But he just did an audio book, I think, that might be, it might even be available for free the audiobook, but I might be wrong. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm misrepresenting that. But we'll be visiting phantoms and monsters in a little bit, but first we're going to start out with the Chronicles, ladies and gentlemen. The Sasquatch Chronicles. Sasquatch. Affleck. No, what is it? What was it? Sam Squatch? <laughs> From, do you ever see that, that show, Sheldon? Uh, Trailer Park Boys? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> Bubbles, the guy with the big, thick glasses. <laughs> There's your Sam Squanch. <laughs> <laughs> that guy cracks me up. That show is so brilliant. God, that was hilarious. <laughs> it's great, actually. Yeah, yeah, it's just classic. Classic. All right, Sam Squanch. Yeah, Maggie. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, you put out SasquatchChronicles.com. Nice job, Sheldon, with the links. Absolutely. Okay. I'm on it. You're on it. All right, let's get to the first one from Sasquatch Chronicles. This one's kind of a shorter one. Special thanks to Wes Germer letting us use these stories for your entertainment and uh, my peace of mind because it makes it really easy to pull stuff up. I just, what's Wes been up to? <laughs> He's feeding our algorithm. All right, so anyway, let's. this is from March 15th, SasquatchChronicles.com, the blog itself. And the first article up is from March 15th, it grinned or smiled at me. Not sure if it was friendly or not. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so with, I don't know if Bigfoot is a traditional primate or if it's more like us, and it actually has the ability to smile and laugh. Um, but if you ever see a chimp showing his teeth, that's a bad sign. That's a sign of very high stress. So he's not smiling at you. The chimps generally not smiling at you, unless they're trained to do that. I mean, the trainers sometimes make them make those grins and stuff. But but I'm talking about, you know, if it's not a trained chimp, if it's at a zoo or something, and it starts smiling at you, that means it's under an extraordinary amount of stress. So I don't know what to make of a Bigfoot smile, but I would probably lean towards that's more of a primate response, and that's not a good sign. But let's read the article and see what happens. A listener writes, Hi, Wes. I had an encounter in North Bend, British Columbia in 2016. I was there for pine mushroom season, 
And I was up on the mountain early in the morning and I heard a sound and I was curious what it was. So I came up to it and I saw what I thought was a bear at first, but it wasn't stood up on two legs. It wasn't, wasn't T stood up on two legs and turned to look at me and we made eye contact. It looked to be about six and a half to seven feet tall and it grinned or smiled at me. I'm not sure if it was friendly or just testing me to come closer. So I went way around it and carried up the mountain to find my friends to keep on mushroom picking. Never heard anything after that, and I still think about it quite often. I don't know if it was a strange thing. Well, yeah, it's a strange thing. Um, Have you ever seen that before? I, You know, I don't know. We don't know how far away it was. Just says they came upon this thing they thought was a bear, but it wasn't a bear. Then it turned and smiled. Was it 50 yards away? Was it 100 yards away? Was it 20 feet away? I don't know. But Oh, I get it. There's supposed to be a comma in there. He's like saying, I don't know, but it was a strange thing, basically. I think is what it's supposed to be read as. I don't know what it was. I don't know. It was a strange thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep, like, you're right. I don't know if it was a strange thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Okay. But in any case, there's a lot we don't know, but I, I got to give this person credit because if you stumble on a Sasquatch, I'm like, yeah, look at that. All right. I got to get going. My friends are waiting. <laughs> it's like, man, <laughs> you're made of a whole different kind of metal than me. That would have been the I point think- where I voided my bowels, I think. I think that part would scare me more just because I don't know the meaning and intent behind it. Maybe, right. maybe they can smile and it means something, but seeing a smiling one's like, whoa, is that the chimp kind of smile yeah. or is that the human well, kind of smile? Right. That's what I'm wondering. It's like, <laughs> what does scary. that mean? I mean, it'd be nice if we could anthropomorphize them enough to say, yes, they have our emotions. I recognize that emotion. That's just like people. They're happy. Very cool. Yeah. But are you sure? Are you really sure? Are you willing to bet your life on that? Because that could mean, oh, crap, I got to kill you now. You saw me. You know, I mean, who knows? I'm just saying, I, I would love to think that these things are peaceful. Uh, not, not, I wouldn't say harmless, but they're, they're peaceful and, and not trying to cause problems or, or to create strife or conflict. They're just doing their thing. But yeah, I don't know. I, again, we just don't know enough about them to make any judgment calls. I think a lot of people do make judgment calls, and, I, and I'm, you know, more power to you, but just be careful because we, you could be dead wrong, and that's sincerely, li, uh, literally. Okay, let's go to the next one from Sasquatch Chronicles blog. This is from March 15th. Uh, at first, I thought it was someone in a Bigfoot costume. You have all the, all the stupid ways to die. And there's been several people that have died. Putting on a Bigfoot costume, jumping out in front of cars, being in areas where you might get shot. Several people have been shot. Pulling the, pulling the big hoaxes, you know. They it's wanted their, moment. yeah, they wanted that moment. And uh, they got it. But in a bad way, in a more, more of a Darwin fashion, really. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know. If you're, if you're that much of a brick that you think, hey, you know what? It's Saturday. I'm a little bored. Why don't I put on the squatch suit and go out and freak out some hikers? You're on your own, partner. <laughs> it's, you just <laughs> you just didn't draw the long straw on that one at all. As long as you're not doing it in hunting season, you know. Well, even if you are, I mean, people in, in a lot of areas that national parks and stuff pack heat. Well, if they're seeing mm-hmm. something they can't understand and are frightened to death, you don't know. I mean, could you blame them? I, I, you know, I, I would never advocate, Hey, what is that? Let's shoot it and find out. Yeah. I'm never advocating that kind of mindset, but you know, if you act like an idiot enough, somebody could think it's very threatening and go, well, you know, my kid's with me. He can't run fast. I, I can't save him. Uh, and I'm going to start shooting. Well, so yeah, again, just the hoaxers are just a, a special kind of stupid really. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, let's continue. At first, I thought it was someone in a Bigfoot costume. A listener writes, I wanted to share my experience since it was it has us really scratching our heads. Around 2006, 2007, off of Marriott'sville Road, we were leaving a friend's house at about 1 a.m.-ish. 
About a truck's length in front, length in front of us, we saw what we thought was someone dressed in a Bigfoot costume. He had to, uh, he had to slam on the brakes to avoid hitting it. It walked across the two-lane road, back road, in three or four strides very casually from a construction area where new houses were being built on the right-hand side and crossed to a farm field on our left. At the time, we were in a sports car, lower to the ground, so I can't tell you how tall this thing was. However, I don't think even a tall human could possibly walk across a two-lane road that quickly without making it look like they were putting an effort into it. We ended up driving past it, but we did turn around to see if we could catch them crossing the road again, or maybe even see them in the very large farm field, but it was no longer there. We truly thought we were in a rural, being in a rural area, it was just a teenager pulling a prank, but now we are really wondering if we saw this alleged, the alleged Sykesville monster. The Sykesville monster is a hairy humanoid from Sykesville, Maryland, which has been sighted since the 70s. The Sykesville monster is a 78-foot-tall hairy hominoid. It's dark brown in color. Cast, uh, casts of the monster's footprints were taken, which are 13 inches long, 7 inches wide. That's a very wide stride. Oh, there's a rendition of it. Okay. That was a good inclusion because, you know, when you get to specific names. Crocodile. Crocodile. It's not a crocodile. It's a Bigfoot. But thank you for your participation. Maybe it has a bite like a crocodile. I don't know. But, yeah, just look at that. Look at that face. Woof. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, it's a very good rendition. I don't know. I mean, yeah. Obviously, it's not an actual photograph, but damn. Yeah. I mean, that that is crazy. A two-lane road in uh, three to four strides. Yeah, that's quite a stride. You know, I don't know if it was paved or if it was just, you know... Um, gravel but still you know that's either way it's it's cut for two cars to cross you know side by side or trucks or whatever and they said it was effortless like there wasn't yeah it was more of a casual stride but it did it so quickly yeah yeah that's a good point i don't know could be could be they saw a squatch we're gonna read uh, a little more of this we're gonna go to the next one which is also sasquatch chronicles blog and uh, this is another, I love these listener emails because, you know, they, I mean, obviously Wes gets a ton of these and could never make all the shows that, of all the emails he gets, but they're oh, still yeah. fascinating because even a, even a um, <clears throat> more casual observation is something, is something to add, add more information to the pile. And so I think maybe a lot of people don't know about these being posted over there, but if you go through Wes's blog and just keep combing back and back, you're going to find thousands of these probably now of these emails he's just posted because he just didn't make a show into them uh, but they're great information in either case so march 13th uh, oh excuse me a weird and extremely bright light in the forest this maybe isn't a cryptid but these weird lights in the forest are a pretty crazy phenomena in and of themselves and some people say well plasma balls and other people say well it's just misrepresented air air traffic or, you know, any number of uh, astronomical anomalies or misrepresentations. I mean, the, the, the debunkers go pretty heavy into trying to, trying to refute these. But there is, you know, some people say ball lightning, which is almost it's as a, paranormal a as thing. a ghost. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's a thing, but it's crazy. I think I saw a video of it once, but yeah. Yeah, you may have, and you may have seen somebody's rendition of it that was made but, in cgi yeah. but yeah, yeah there's, there's one that's where it's going over these like train tracks and it's sparking as it passes and that's oh that's the one yeah, yeah that's not legitimate okay I, yeah but it looks really good it was really well done but no yeah that's not real all right march 13th a weird and extremely bright light in the forest a listener writes i live on 80 acres of a remote part of texas in 2012 my wife and i were sitting out one night on our pier, stargazing. Suddenly in the dense woods across the pond, I saw an extremely bright light, as if a spotlight had turned on. The orb, if you will, floated through the woods across the creek that feeds the pond, and the orb broke into smaller lights and then disappeared. I looked at my wife sitting next to me, and she, much to my relief, said, I saw it. Later that night, I decided to stay at the cabin that's 
sits about 40 yards from the pond. And my wife went on, on to the house for the night. About 3 a.m., I went outside to use the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you did. When I heard a loud wood knock to the south of the cabin. About 10 seconds later, I heard another loud wood knock just north of the cabin. I never made the connection of the orb and the wood knocks until I began listening to your show and heard the accounts of others. I'm excited about the possibility of an undiscovered bipedal humanoid uh, and hope the day arrives when this myth becomes reality. I was just uh, uh, today at uh, Elijah's school. He had uh, uh, conferences and there was a bunch of uh, kids, a whole class of kids all did like watercolor paintings of, of panda bears. Yeah. And I, I couldn't help but think, and I talked to Elijah about it. I said, did you know <laughs> that for yeah. a long time, pandas were considered absolute folklore, just, just wives tales, just, you know, a bunch of, uh, you know, hoopla. And I said, and it took like 60 years of expeditions to actually prove they're real. And uh, I said, so when you think about Sasquatch, that could be very much the same thing. And uh, he thought that was interesting because, you know, in his whole life, in all of your life, I mean, it's just been a, a known. In all my life, it's been a known. But before that, there was just no concept in our sciences, our biological sciences, that would allow for this huge bear creature to live in China and subsist on vegetation. It was just a bunch of ho 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 hokey crap. They had no time for it, you know. They just discarded it like, yeah, okay. You know, because here it is a black and white animal. It's living in a very green forest and it still took 60 years of expeditions to find it. Now, granted, it was in a pretty remote area, but the area they were counted in was very small. It was only like, you know, a couple hundred square miles where these things allegedly existed. And I'm just kind of I'm just kind of uh, estimating that. I know it was a very, a very finite space where the panda were believed to be, and it still took 60 years of searching to find them there. Super and crazy. it is, it is, because that's not a small animal, and no. it's not like they blend in. Pandas no, they don't. Plant pandas don't blend in. They're they're absolutely like, you know, like uh, the the square peg in the round hole or the round the round <laughs> peg in the square hole. They just didn't fit in, but they still managed to avoid discovery for 60 years. So, yeah. you know, that's a great example of, well, maybe there's a lot of things out there we just don't understand. You know, our arrogance would say, oh, we got it all nailed. We got it all sorted out. We know what's out there, folks. Just tune in. We'll tell you. No, we don't. No. We don't. No way, Elaine. There, Lane says there are people today that don't believe they're real. <laughs> no way. Are you serious? There's I don't still know. people like that? I don't know. That wouldn't surprise me. I, you know, I gotta tell you, folks, and and I'm not, I'm not casting aspersions. Well, kind of, I am. And, yeah, and I'm bit. sorry. A little aspersions. <laughs> a little aspersions, but well, my point is, is that it's surprising to me the amount of things that people will believe. And, and I'm not saying what they believe is impossible. I mean, how can I know? But I'm, I, I still have this huge, even though I'm a firm believer in all of this stuff that we talk about on the show, and I think that all of this represents very, very real phenomena, having experienced a bunch myself and having yeah. talked to so many people that have come face to face with this stuff, I, I don't have any doubt that people are seeing and, and experiencing incredible events. But still, there's, it goes even further that there are there's just ideas for everything out there and it's like wait can all of it be real well maybe i don't know but it gets hard for me to wrap my head around anyway this is oh, yeah. show. this show is not about me but anyway that's the bright light in the forest i just think that stuff's interesting i think we'll read one more just cuz it's sasquatch chronicles and yes. there's so much here to dig into Oh, yeah. All right, so Sasquatch Chronicles blog. Next one is from March 13th. Dad said Bigfoot wasn't real, but a gorilla lived in the woods. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't, I don't think we read this one before. This was a new one on the posting, so I don't think there's any way we, we ran into it. 
Um, a listener writes, I've never believed in Sasquatch until listening to your show during a Phoenix heat wave in the summer of 2023. I've been blaming bear and cougar for all of the weird things that happened in the past 58 years of my life. My father always told me that Bigfoot wasn't real, but there was a gorilla that lived in the woods and that he thought escaped from Washington, D.C. Zoo. My father was born in, uh, in Virginia in 1938, and he said when he was seven years old, about 1945, his family lived on a county road in Springfield, Virginia, surrounded by woods. There was a dilapidated house, two-story house, without any windows, and about 100 yards from their residence, and there were no other houses within a quarter mile of their property. Well, one day, some friends were walking up the driveway and saw someone in a window opening on the second floor of the old house holding a tree branch with leaves on it. At the time, my dad had an older brother that was 14 years old. The older brother grabbed a 12-gauge shotgun and went to investigate. My dad followed his brother up the stairs to the second story, and when they approached the top of the stairs, his brother fired the shotgun and screamed, and he turned around and ran past my dad down the steps and out of the house. Oh, jeez. He just blindly shoots, screams, and runs. He must have saw something. Then decided he was noping right out of there. Uh, he said, my dad ran behind him, and when they got to the house, my dad asked what he saw. His brother told him that there was a black gorilla standing in the middle of the room, and he shot it. When their father got home that evening, he went to investigate, but said the house was empty. As the years went by, my dad would hear noises in the woods around the house that sounded like something jumping out of the trees and running on two legs. He would also hear tree crashes, but could never find the source of the noise. When my father got into his 20s, his dad and his brothers built a house about a mile away from the old house they used to live in. One day, one of his brothers had bought a new pistol. There was nothing behind the house but woods for miles, and his brother randomly fired one round into the woods, and there was an immediate loud scream that came from out of the woods close by that sounded like a woman. Around this same moment in time, we had a neighbor that lived a few miles away. One night, she let out her three small dogs to do their business. After a few minutes, the dogs came running up on the porch. She was letting them in the house when when uh, what she described as a six-foot-tall gorilla ran onto the porch within a few feet of her and quickly slammed the door shut. I remember hearing my mother telling the story to a friend when I was six years old, and she mentioned that the, the woman was looking down at the dogs when it ran up, and it had three toes on its feet. Oh, it sounds like a Momo. What's the, a Momo? Mm, the Missouri monster. Momo is a very Bigfoot type creature, but its tracks are apparently three toed. Mm. Around this same time, we had a small beagle dog that lived outside. And one evening, right before dark, we heard gravel hitting the house and the dog was squealing. When we went out to investigate, we could hear the dog still squealing, but the dog squealing was rapidly moving from the house to deep into the woods. And finally, we could no longer hear the dog. Aww. Aww. It was like he was traveling much faster than he could run. The dog came home a few days after, and he was scared to come into the house and hid under a truck in the driveway. What? Wow. So he didn't kill it. Wow, I'm, I'm impressed. Momo was killing dogs in Missouri. A lot of them. When I was about five years old, my dad built a sandbox for me in the back of the house next to the woods. It got to the point that every time I was out there by myself, I would hear a very loud hooting similar to an owl. It made me scared, and I quit playing there. I have a brother who's six years older than me, and I always thought that he was weird or just making up stories. He said he kept seeing a person in the woods leaning against a tree and watching the house. He said that he had seen someone looking into a window one evening. And, uh, I'm sorry, I lost my place. My dad went outside and tried to recreate the incident at the window, which was in the door. He, and my dad doubted his claim because the person would have been seven feet tall. 
When we got older, and my brother was uh, 25 years old, he had been keeping a secret because he didn't think anyone would believe him. He said that one night he saw two red eyes looking into our bedroom window. My brother was always scared of the woods and the dark, which I never understood, but maybe he had legitimate reasons. My brother was, uh, had gotten a pup tent as a gift and was excited about camping for the first time, and he was 13 at the time, and I was 7. We crossed the road next to our house into some woods that did not have any houses along the area for about a half a mile in either direction. We put the tent up uh, in the day and waited till sunset to go to the tent. We're laying there for about 30 minutes when we started hearing what sounded like children playing. It was now 10 o'clock, and my brother said that there weren't any houses in the area of the sounds. It started getting closer and had morphed into a baby crying. Well, as it got close, it started coming from more than one direction. By this time, it had gotten to probably within 75 yards of us. We were pretty scared, but then it got worse. It started coming from different directions. It sounded like four to five different animals in separate locations making the same baby sounds. We climbed out of the tent and went home, banging on the door, waking up our parents. My dad told us it was uh, bobcats, but now 51 years later and having camped and hunted my whole life, I've never heard sounds like that in the woods. When I was seven years old, my father leased a farm in West Virginia. There was a long driveway that was about 1.5 to 2 miles long. The farm was really secluded and had these strange large rock piles in one area of some woods that were referred to as the Indian Mountains. One evening we could hear what sounded like a rhythmic drum sounding, pounding sound coming from one of the mounds. It was slow but steady and lasted for about 15 minutes. It made everyone uncomfortable and uneasy, but the source of the noise was never identified. My dad and his brothers had been clearing roads into woods off the driveway about 300 yards from the house. I had a small Honda 50 motorcycle. Oh, I remember those. Those were really funny. They had big fat tires. They were about the size of a trike. (laughs) Uh, the, The old Z50 Hondas, yeah. And I ran out of gas at the end of the logging road. And there was a smell, and it was like a cross between raw sewage and something dead. I thought that one of my dad's brothers was down the logging road about 100 yards because I could hear large logs being thrown and limbs snapping. I kept looking, but I couldn't see anything. When I got back to the house, I saw the whole family was at the house, and it really scared me. A few years later, it was 1975, and my parents had separated. My mother rented a house on a, on a back road in Frederick County, Virginia. I was 10 years old, and I would go visit a friend after dinner about 6 p.m. in the winter, which would, have, which would be after sunset and dark, and he only lived about a quarter mile from my house, and I would ride my skateboard to his house. By this time, we already killed an eight-point hour eight point buck two years earlier at the age of eight years old, and belonged to a gun club. I wasn't afraid of the dark or the woods, and on the way, on the road to my friend's home, there was a stretch in the road that had woods on one side and a cow pasture on the other that lasted for about 100 yards. No street lights were on the road, and it was very dark and virtually no cars on this road at night. One night on the way there, when I got to the woods on my right, I started smelling a stench that I remembered from the old farm several years earlier. Over the sound of the skateboard wheels, I could hear something large milling around about 50 yards from the road to my right. Excuse me. I was, I was trying, it was trying to be quiet, but it was too large to make its presence unknown. I remember thinking that it had to be a bear or something like supersized buck. I didn't like it on the, on the way home. It was still there a couple hours later. The next night it was there again, and this time it made me really nervous, and I rode as fast as I could, and I stayed as far from the woods as I could. I didn't go back to my friend's house at night anymore, but never told them why. This is a long story. 
My grandparents owned about 180 acres in Frederick County, which I hunted with my grandfather until he passed away in 1990, when I was 25 years old. Back in the days before he passed, when we hunted, the deer trails were about 16 inches wide. When we killed a deer, we would gut them in the forest, and after butchering them, we would dump the carcass in a ravine on the property, and it would take a week or longer for the buzzards to eat everything. I lost interest in hunting after his death at about 1995. When I was 30 years old, I decided to start hunting again. When I returned to the woods to hunt, I found that the deer trails had grown to about four to five feet wide and were very smooth, almost like a pedestrian path in a park. I thought I was really unusual and I started hunting and would kill two deer at the beginning of the season every November for the next five years, but things were different when it came to deer remains. I could dump guts and carcasses, sometimes two carcasses, in the same day. And by the next morning, everything was gone. The guts and the carcasses. The only way that you could tell that I had dumped anything was by the blood on the ground. My grandmother would let others hunt there occasionally. One morning, it was I was in my tree stand, and I heard what sounded like a very large, clumsy hunter walking in the woods and was snapping off tree limbs as he walked. And then the sound stopped. I thought that a hunter had arrived late in the daytime and was sitting about 100 yards from me in a ravine. Weird place to hunt, but I was pissed. I got down out of my stand and walked down there and couldn't find anyone. So I walked back to the farm, and to my shock, there was not any other vehicles there. I was the only person hunting. In the, in the 90s, I did some tent camping, and I decided to go camping in West Virginia at a state park near a small town named Brandywine Station. It had a swimming and fishing lake with a campground, and it was about 1993, and I didn't want to be near other campers and decided to stay in the overflow area at the back of the campground up in the woods next to a steep ridge and a dry creek bottom. Well, I set up camp, and a few hours later, the rocks started falling down from the ridge next to my camp. At first I thought they were being dislodged by bears up on the ridge, foraging for food like, like ants or something. I remember seeing a rock about 8 inches in diameter and about 3 inches thick, landing about 20 feet from me. Keep in mind, I didn't believe in Sasquatch and thought it had to be another reason for this. The rocks fell all night long, and at one point I heard something large walk through my camp in the middle of the night. In the summer of 99, I decided to take a solo motorcycle camping trip to the same location, and it didn't go so well. I arrived in the evening and set up camp. I had some coffee after setting up my tent and making my bedding. I left about 6 p.m. for a motorcycle ride, and when I returned to camp at about 10 p.m. in the dark and saw that the tent was down. At first, I thought that a peg had let loose, and... I pulled the tent and looked, and it looked like someone had taken a knife and cut the tent in a very straight vertical cut for about four feet. As I was looking at the tent in the dark with a small headlamp, I heard something about 30 yards from me start walking away. It sounded like it was on two feet and very large. I didn't believe in Sasquatch and assumed it was a black bear weighing at least 500 pounds. It was snapping limbs off as it walked, but suddenly stopped at about 75 yards from my camp. And all of my belongings in the tent were on the ground and looked as if they had been rolled. None of my food was disturbed, but it was all canned goods for this very reason. After about 10 minutes, I heard it returning, and as it got closer, it became stealthier. The direction it was coming from was a series of ditches and dry creek beds, with pine forests covered in pine needles on the ground. It was probably within 30 feet of me, but I couldn't see it. I only knew it was there because I could hear an occasional snap of a twig. I was only armed with a Glock 9 millimeter pistol. I had a three, three 15 round clips, but I figured that I would be dead by the time I had any effect on the bear. That I now know was something entirely more dangerous. I immediately walked to my motorcycle and started it and hoped the engine noise would keep it at bay long enough for me to ride away. I left all my belongings and hoped like hell that it didn't attack me from behind as I was attempting to ride away. 
It was three hours to home on deer-infested roads, but I was just glad to be alive. I had a roommate back then and told him about what happened, and he said that he would be interested in returning to the same area the following weekend, and we both be on motorcycles. What about 9 p.m.? It was getting dark, and we arrived at an unplanned location after problems picking a camp spot. We ended up closer to the main road, Route 33, than we wanted, which was about 100 yards, and we were next to a flowing creek that was prob- about 40 to 55 y- or 50 yards across, but it was probably no more than three feet deep. It was still summer, and we had an almost full moon that night, and we set up camp and decided to go down to the creek that night, and for some reason, we did not build a fire. We sat by the creek in bright moonlight and consumed a 12-pack of beer <laughs> between the two of us, and it was now 2 a.m., and we decided to go up to our tents. Within not even three minutes, I could hear something behind my tent, only 20 yards at most away. I thought, damn bear, and kept ignoring it as it kept breaking branches every five seconds near me. My friend yells over, what the hell are you doing over there? And I yell back, nothing. There's a damn bear behind my tent. We both exit our tents with pistol and flashlights drawn. I had my Glock 19, and he had his Glock 33, which is 45 caliber. And after about 30 seconds, my friend yelled, Eyes! and fired about five to six rounds, and I followed him in the same direction of fire, and let off about five to six shots also. We stood there in the dark, completely silent, turned off our lights. We stood there in the darkness for about ten minutes, and eventually went to bed soon after. Never heard anything the rest of the night after that. About a month or so later, some friend and I decided to go camping at the end of the logging road, and it was five miles long, and the closest paved road was Route 55, which went through the National Forest for about three miles on the Virginia-West Virginia border. My friend and I rode his vehicle in his vehicle, and he had brought his two-year-old German Shepherd dog, and we drove off the way uh, off to the end of the road just to see if anyone else, if anyone else was back there. I was completely, it was completely deserted except for us. We set up camp at about 7 p.m. Once camp was set up, the dog started barking into this one area of the forest. This dog would normally attack any animal, but it would not leave the camp, only bark vehemently. We quit after about 20 minutes in the deep tree over us, and the deep tree cover was blocking out the sun. Once it got almost dark, it was quiet, and at about 9 p.m., the fire crackling, when I heard the small rock landing on the ground about 20 feet away, and it landed near the back of my friend's vehicle. The dog was not aware of the rock. I had caught a glimpse of it right as it hit the ground. It was only about two inches long and half an inch thick. I asked my friend what was that, and he said it was a rock, and I said that it was a rock, then somebody threw it. I drew my pistol and walked towards the direction the rock had been thrown. We were about 45 feet or 40 feet off the logging road when the rock had come from that direction, and it was near dark, but I could see without a light. I went to the road by myself. Normally the dog would have been in front of me, but oddly he stayed next to the fire with his owner. I looked behind trees and investigated the road in both directions for 50 yards each way from the camp, and I returned to my friend and told him that if it's a person, that they're hiding really well. A few hours went by, and now it's almost midnight. We heard tree crash and a knock, but didn't think anything of it, nor did the dog, and I decided to do some coyote howls for fun. Within five minutes of my howls, I heard the loudest sound in the woods that I have ever heard. It was about a 100 yards away and sounded like a giant hoot, but sort of like a gorilla grunt. You could tell the sound had come from a very large mouth and lungs. It was super loud and creepy. The dog only stared intently in the direction of the sound. I hooted at it like I was an owl. And then we heard it take off running in it as it was crashing limbs and making a lot of noise but ran to the west of us, and soon we didn't hear it anymore. About 30 minutes later, a super loud hoot sound came out of the woods from the direction as the rock earlier. It had snuck up on us and was now only 50 yards maximum from our camp. 
I told my friend that if this is an animal, we need to see it. I left the camp walking in the direction of the sound and into the woods across the logging road. Man, this is long. I searched the woods by myself. My friend and his dog stayed in the camp, and I looked everywhere and didn't see anything. When I got back to the camp, I told my friend that I was going to bed. I also told my friend that just in case we were dealing with a person out there that I was dumping some rounds into the woods that I had searched, I emptied 15 rounds of 9mm in a fanning pattern left to right to maximize the target area. We went to bed and didn't hear anything the rest of the night. In 2000, I went camping at a small campground near Pawpaw, West Virginia, and I camped there before and never had any problems or anything abnormal happen before. One night while camping, I'd been drinking, and it was about midnight or 1 a.m. <clears throat> I heard what I thought was a bear approach in the camp. I hadn't even heard of Dogman. The fire was burning really good, but the sounds of it approaching seemed like it was coming straight towards the camp. Not being sober, I got the stupid idea that I would sneak into the woods and stand in the dark and surprise the bear with my light. Oh. Holy bad ideas, Batman. Jeez. Not Batman in the chat, another Batman. <laughs> yeah, different one. <laughs> I had left my gun on the table in the camp like an idiot, and when the bear got within 30 feet of me, I clicked on my light, and what I saw next was not what I expected. It was all black, had a head like a bear, but the muzzle wasn't, wasn't, what, tan? Like every black bear I had seen in the region. It had big yellow eyes. It was hunched forward like a hyena, and it was about as tall as myself at five foot nine inches. But if it had stood up on its hind leg, it would have been much taller. Oh, so it's, it's five foot nine on its fours. Whoa. It had very long muscular front arms of at least five feet long and looked as if it had its front hands or claws curled backwards like it was walking on, on its front wrists. Mm -hmm. The arms were like that of an alpha male kangaroo, but the elbows kicked slightly to each side. After two seconds of face-to-face -face looking at each other, it collapsed down on its belly and made a sharp turn to its right and rapidly scuttled into dark where I couldn't see it. It hadn't run away, it was completely silent, and it was right there in the brush, hiding in the dark. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up, and I realized I had made a foolish mistake, and I was probably in danger. Well, I kept my light pointed in the direction of the animal and slowly backed away to the camp and grabbed my gun. I built the fire up and eventually went into the tent. Nothing happened the rest of the night. Holy big... I, I, there's so much more. How, what time is it? Uh, 10.30, my time. 8.30, yeah, 8 your time. Okay, so in 2011, I moved to Richard, Richmond, Virginia, and had a co-worker at that time that owned a farm just outside the city. Well, he told me that he'd seen a Sasquatch on his property, and I thought he was being ridiculous, but I didn't let in on that, that I didn't believe such nonsense. In 2019, I bought a house outside the city, and I was not that far from where the co-worker owned his land. The area I lived in was very wooded with swamps, fields, and lakes. And it was within a mile or, or, or two of the James River. Within about the third night we were there, it was about 10 p.m. in the summer, and there was a huge crashing sound against the uh, attached gorge, and it sounded like a tree had fallen in on it. I went outside to investigate, but I didn't find anything. A couple nights later, I was sitting in my living room, and there, were in, uh, there was a window on my left, and I was about three feet from it. The window was three feet wide and five feet tall. When you're outside, the distance from the ground to the, gr uh, to the bottom of the window is about five feet. When sitting there in the living room, I could always see my neighbor's yard lights next door, and another neighbor had lights as, uh, as well further down the street. While sitting there this particular night... I just happened to notice that I didn't see any lights on the window. I leaned closer to the window to see through my own reflection. What I saw was reddish brown hair, about three inches in length, about 24 inches away on the other side of the glass. Oh, no. Whatever was blocking out the lights had to be at least nine feet tall 
and that's a conservative estimate. I was already wearing my pistol and jumped up and ran to the front door with my gun in hand. I ran completely around the house, in the dark, and didn't see or hear anything. In the months after that, I used to think that there was a house in the woods behind us because I thought that I would hear people talking back there. One night when my wife and I were in the hot tub on our deck, we heard a strange bird call from the same area. It was close and sounded like it came out of a human's mouth. It only did it once, and I've never heard a sound like that since. I looked at the property on Google Earth, and I walked back there, and there's nothing but woods and standing water about a foot deep. I totally believe, wow, look at this. I totally believe that Sasquatch kidnap, kill, and eat people. Sometimes they kidnap a person out of curiosity. And if the person, a human can't survive because of exposure and shock of being held captive and toyed with by a primitive creature. Once the woods explode with people searching for the person, the Sasquatch will place a, a, a body where it will be found in order to get the searchers to leave the woods. That is why when the body is found, it will sometimes have its clothes on backwards or be unclothed and sometimes wearing someone else's clothes. The people that are never found are eaten. Would a Sasquatch save a person? If we can believe stories of dogs saving people, then I suppose that an intelligent hominid could do the same. There are stories about bulletproof Sasquatch. Hollow points and hunting ammo are not effective because of their expansion when hitting thick hide. I don't think that the caliber is as important, though. I would never carry a 9mm into the woods. I sold every 9mm that I had and now only carry 10mm or 45 caliber pistols with high-performance solid nose ammo if I'm in the woods. For rifles, uh, the ammo needs to be an FMJ or better, yet armor-piercing <laughs> ammunition with the minimum caliber of 5.56 NATO or higher 30-round magazines are mandatory because if you're going to need every bullet. In the cases where people fire single warning shots, it is not enough to intimidate a Sasquatch. You want, to, you want them to believe that they can't guess where the next round will hit, and they will leave you alone. They aren't stupid. Should you kill a Sasquatch? I look at it like any wild animal. If it's threatening you, or you want to eat it, then go ahead. Killing them for sport loses its allure for me. When the animal is intelligent, we also don't know what the role that they play in our ecosystem is anyway, if any. Yeah, that's interesting. Holy jeez. That was that was a, a book. That was that, a, that was an excerpt. I mean, it's a hell of a lot of information to go through. I you know, I I can appreciate his point of view. I, I think you're better safe than sorry. And I don't know about I don't know enough about ballistics to know what hollow point i mean obviously hollow points expand on impact but mm -hmm. I mean, you can still shoot a hollow pointed ammo through a two by four you know easily like oh for sure i mean it, and I, if it can I, go through it, a two by four is it really not able to penetrate a hide and bone i don't know it can go through a car door wild car doors uh, but yeah, yeah probably yeah, yeah. Well, but there's not much I mean, to car doors really <laughs> Well, yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, the, th the thing is, is I, I guess if I was ever going in the woods, I would prepare for a bad bear encounter. So I wouldn't yeah. find a nine millimeter. Yeah, Absolutely I think, not. I think he's right. You know, just have a, a full metal jacket kind of thing cooking, if that's the right term. I don't even know. Yeah. FMJ, full metal jacket. That's um, yeah, as okay. much penetrating power as possible, I guess. Yeah. I mean, even that, a two, two, three full metal jacket will you know punch holes through most animals, I think. Oh, yeah. As long as it doesn't expand. Um, yeah. But anyway, I'll have to ask my cousin Paul. He's he's Mr. Ballistics. He knows all this stuff. But Oh, yes. At any rate, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a great story. It's really quite comprehensive. Uh, clearly, it sounds like he saw both Bigfoot and Dogman in all of these experiences. I kind of wonder, sense. though, the thing that's curious to me is that in his case, everywhere he went, he was encountering this stuff. And you got to wonder if, if after experiencing it once, are you somehow, I, 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 and I think the answer is yes. Are you somehow more likely to encounter more? Is that, is that a possibility? And I, and I think it is. Yes. I, it seems to me that if person has one experience, maybe, maybe it's just your mind is more tuned into what to look for, because this is so far out of, out of context for anything we ever experience. 
And so maybe the first experience is like, oh, my God. But then after that, your mind's now cohesively aware of the presence of other things out there and maybe doesn't discard as much information regarding that when you're in the woods. Because I can't remember what the math is, but I think every second our brains are discarding, you know, possibly millions of pieces of information and just funneling what it believes or what, what might be the most important stuff to our conscious mind. And so obviously we're perceiving a lot more than we process, mm -hmm. but maybe after an experience like that, it opens up that awareness or the mental processes that need to be present in order to, you know, to observe it, you know, effectively observe it. So I don't know. Shooting fans are distressing. Shooting fans are distressing. What does that mean? Oh, you don't like guns, Elaine? I'm still disturbed by the shooting fan thing. Oh, the, the fanning just means he, he, he went from left to right, just blindly shooting in the woods. Um, well, I, yeah. underst I understand. It's, pro it's a little irresponsible, I guess. But yeah, probably. Depends <laughs> on what kind of woods it is, how dense it is. Yeah. If there's, you know, civilization just a little further out. Yeah. No, I got I gotcha. think it depends on the... But it is, it is a little... But then again, <laughs> I mean, when you're in that scenario... Yeah. You're face to face with something like that. Maybe, you know, just didn't want to pop off one shot to scare it. Maybe just fanning like it, get, get away from it, you know, because you're in the scenario. Yeah. I mean when you're when you're thinking you might be on the menu, it might be coming. I'm I, I understand what you're saying. It is it does seem like a wildly irresponsible thing to do because you don't know. Somebody could have be struggling to get their way out of the woods and like, oh God, there's a campsite. And they're working towards it and all of a sudden there's a fan of bullets coming into the woods. It's like, ah, you know. Yeah. Um, you just don't know. But on the other hand, if you've, if you've encountered something that's absolutely terrifying and it, and it's freaking you out and, and clearly is trying to mess with you, you don't know if that means that you're, you're about to be a sandwich or if you're just being toyed with. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I'm, I become more of a fan of fanning the woods at that point because yeah, I mean, you just don't know. You don't know what, right. what kind of Sasquatch or Dogman you're dealing with. You right. You don't know which, which one of the spectrum you have in front of you. Yeah. Yeah, I it could mean, be. I, it, it, sure, it's irresponsible. I get what you guys are saying, but yeah. put yourself in their shoes. I mean, once, once you know, thought process becomes reality right in front of you, Yeah. it's just a whole different scenario of adrenaline and fear. Yeah. But I do get what you're saying, though. Yeah, I just, you know, I'm... <laughs> If, if, if it's, if it's me or, or some, some possibly, uh, harmful creature, I, I'm probably going to pick me, you know, <laughs> and, and maybe that makes me a selfish bastard, but it's like, you know, I hope it's not that lost camper, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you're just trying to make a statement and you know, what do you do? I mean, Barbara, you're right. right. Announce if you're gonna if you're going to do that. Yes, that's and a I good think point. he said. I think he did say he did announce, but yeah. announce your intentions in case it is a human lost in the woods. Then maybe do it if you're going to. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. But Trace Linnell says it's like weed whacking. Don't hit the gen the gentle beings, just the scary predators. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. You try not to take out bunnies and stuff as you're doing it, but yeah. At any rate. Probably not a lot of bunnies. Well, maybe bunnies are out at night. I think they're out at night because oh, owls yeah. like them a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, we've heard those those Elaine. horrible screams in the night, which yeah. are um, possibly bunnies at least. Yeah, I've I've heard know. bunny screams and they're absolutely horrifying. Um, Elaine says I was singing and wearing red in the woods, and a hunter had a gun pointed at me. Thought I was a deer. Idiot. <laughs> I, I've never understood those stories, too. Like, when you wear, like, really obvious and not nature-y clothes. Like, you're not wearing yeah. brown. Yeah. You're not wearing black. You're wearing red. Yeah. Like, other than flowers where, and birds, where does that naturally come from other than, <laughs> I guess, blood? But that's so weird. Yeah, you'd think. But, I mean, you know, if you've been, if you've been sitting in a, in a, you know, a deer blind for, you know, six hours and then somebody comes in, there's movement, you know. Um, oh, yeah. I had that happen to me. I was hiking in the woods in Minnesota and I, I came up with, with two friends. We were all hiking up, up this ravine. It was a dry and you know, dry run or whatever. And we got to the top and off to the right suddenly said, 
Oh my God, you guys are so lucky. I'm like, look over. I didn't realize it was hunting season. I was, I was, you know, probably about 17 years old. And oh. uh, it, there I looked over to the right. And this guy had a, you know, his rifle aimed at us because he thought that, that he heard the sounds coming, couldn't see, but he thought some deer were moving up the ravine from going down and, you know, and to the water source. And he thought we were deer. And I'm glad that he verified before he pulled the trigger because one of us would have been dead. So I've been, I've been through that. I've done that. And one thing to do that you, well, one thing you can, I do know about this. One thing you can do if you're hiking through the woods is bring like, just, I mean, they do sell these things called bear bells where you just wear around your wrist or whatever. And so it makes noise so that like bears, whatnot notice they hear your presence, they go away, but humans could also notice that too. If it's hunting season. Yeah. You know, wait, that, that, that deer has a bell. He exactly. must got caught yeah. by, caught by a farmer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, caught in the farmer's field. Do that, or maybe just talk while you're in the woods. Yeah, I think <laughs> you know? I think that's the big takeaway. Is you know, I mean, if you're hunting, obviously you don't want to talk because you're not yeah. trying to scare things off. But if you're not hunting, when we're out mushroom mushroom hunting up here, I mean, we're having conversations, you know, and things like that because I don't want to surprise anything up here. You know, yeah, yeah. I don't want to know what that looks like. You know. So, yeah, you're right. Making noise is good. Mm-hmm. That's why I was singing to warn bears. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't account for intelligence sometimes, Elaine, Un- unfortunately. <laughs> Just get a Bluetooth speaker and blast. Can't touch this. <laughs> hammer time. <laughs> yeah, you don't want them to drop the wrong hammer, not the one on their gun. Boom. <laughs> hammer time. Boom. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I thought that was funny in my head. Sorry. How do you sneak up on a mushroom? <laughs> <laughs> Philip Blair, so how do you sneak up on a mushroom? Because he said mushroom hunting. <laughs> yeah, we don't. We don't bother trying to sneak up on them. We just we figure we can probably we can probably take them in a sprint. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, where's the bell? And sing yeah. a song. Wear a bell and sing the song. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely, Trace. I you know, I I mean it's I anybody that really has been hunting a long time probably isn't gonna be you know, too, too trigger happy, but there's a lot of people getting into hunting and those are the ones you got to worry about. Cause they don't know what the hell they're doing. They're just, <laughs> oh, I don't want to miss this. I don't want to miss some shot. And, and they see movement and just start plugging, you know, there's a lot of hunters that shoot each other wearing blaze orange. And that's, that's a tragedy. That's so crazy to me. Right. How does that happen? It's a, because they, there's a lot of bad hunters. <laughs> There's yeah, a, terrible. Yeah. You, you look at what you're shooting. If you just shoot at movement. It's so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not good. Not good. Not good. But oh, hey, David Barnes, welcome in. Oh, Maggie. And Pear- Maggie with the five <laughs> golders. Thank you, Maggie. Appreciate it. <clears throat> really David Barnes says, Sheldon, you're getting a necklace too. Is there... Is Woo. there something I'm unaware of? Yeah, his uh, his his girlfriend, Jangji Jules. Um, I don't know how to pronounce it, Jangji. Uh, she's a wonderful uh, jewelry craftsman and craftsperson, Ooh. and uh, she makes these uh, crystal jewelry. It's really cool. They made me a necklace, and and I wear it very regularly, especially when I'm doing paranormal investigating because it's got all the right elements on it that are supposed to ward away. Ward away negative things. So especially crystal, I will never take it off. Legitimately, I will never. I I have necklaces I've been legitimately wearing for years. Yeah, I don't take them off. Yeah, you don't. You kind of learned that from me, I think, didn't you? Yep, I did. Yeah, <laughs> I'm almost looking like Mr. T up in here. I'm just saying, <laughs> I pity the fool. <laughs> there we go. Yep. Yeah, I've had my my uh, my hag stone and and uh, dragon on for years and years and years and years. Since I was 18, I guess. Well, not the Hagstone. I found that in my 30s. but Or no, mm-hmm. 40s. I found that in 40s. So about a decade I've had the Hagstone on. But anyway, yeah, true stories. It's being made now. I'll, Woo! Awesome, thank brother. Thank you so much. I will, I will cherish it, and I will never take it off. Yeah, she, his, his uh, girlfriend's company is called Love Rocks Company. And if you want to check that out, ladies and gentlemen, check our Discord server again because it's in the, um, what is it? what's the thread called in Discord where marketplace oh, um, portal marketplace. Yeah, marketplace and you can see the jewelry tab 
there's a few people that are in there that make jewelry things, um, and they're wonderful, really, really wonderful stuff. So, yeah, Love Rocks Company. I think it's on Etsy, but you can see some of the things she's made, and uh, they're posted on that thread. So definitely oh, yeah. support it. And you can uh, post it. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And you can, um, if you are uh, belonging to our Discord and you make things that you want to offer for sale, please post them in there in that Marketplace tab or the Marketplace thread. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I love the idea that you guys offer whatever you do. If you're yeah. into sculpting, offer that. If you're into painting, offer that. If you're into, you know, uh, digital art, do that. You know, I oh think it's gosh. wonderful. Great stuff. Those are some beautiful necklaces too. Wow. Right? Yeah. I mean, it's really, really cool. Oh my God. Right? She's very gifted. She's very talented. I'm excited now. I'm super excited. I think David helps too. For you know, in all fairness, I think he, I think he pitches in a little. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> even more oh my god they're so beautiful super great maggie m10 yeah um unfortunately we're we're like literally just minutes away from being done wow how do we there's get the, here there's the illusion again the illusion of time well here you guys here's the link to the love rocks um love rocks company yeah Put it's it an etsy site and check it out that's david's uh, girlfriend's uh jewelry company and she's does really beautiful stuff she, she sold a few a few items through our, our Discord, which is really cool. But again, it's an open marketplace for any of you to take part in, please, by all means. If you need more threads made in there, like you're like, oh, I make this and there's not really a proper place to post it, let us know. We can always create different threads. If you want a pottery one, if you want, if you do crochet or, or you know, any kind of, you know, crafting thing, just let us know. It's okay, Jason. It's better late than never. Uh but we're almost done for tonight. It's just gone so quickly. That story was very, very long. I couldn't believe that. It just kept going and going, but it was very cool. Oh, get, it was a great story. Yeah, I mean, it's a lifetime of this person's experience from being a kid all the way up to a, you know, a modern day. So that's an incredible window into his experiences. It's, it's you know, I mean, the other takeaway is that Generally, things in the forest don't throw things. <laughs> you know? Now, I will say, I will say, though, things always fall from trees. And so you can't think everything that sounds like something being thrown is something being thrown. you got to really investigate it. But mm -hmm. if you see things being thrown that are not coming from a tree above you and they're coming in your direction, yeah, that's not a squirrel. That's not a chipmunk. <laughs> it's not a, a possum or a rabbit or anything like that. They just can't do it. It's Just remember, rocks, rocks don't fall from trees. No, they, they shouldn't anyway. <laughs> so, I mean, that's a big takeaway, and that was a common thread in this person's experience. The other thing that's very interesting, just revisiting that a little bit, my best friend in high school, sh oh, what? Shot a guy dressed up as a deer in Eugene. Search oh, that's Trevor so Foster. Oh, he's the GM of Honda in Eugene today. I hope the guy lived. That's terrifying. But if he was dumb enough to dress up as a deer, I don't know what to tell you. That's just I don't feel too bad for him to be honest. <laughs> you can't. I really don't. You know, it's one of those hold my beer moments. It's like you know, hey, hold my beer. I'm going to do something. And it's like God, if you could just suck that moment back. It's like me doing this show, and when I say something stupid, it's like God, I wish I could sw just <laughs> suck that back into my lungs and swallow. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But it's like a, a way worse version because. I mean, my God, you know, punching holes in somebody's body is absolutely, that's, that's game over in a lot of cases. So, oh yeah, I had a squirrel drop a pine cone on me, a little rascal. Yeah. I mean, they, they eat pine cones and pine cones. We have all kinds of conifer trees up here and, uh, they're always dropping pine cones. That's just normal. So I don't ever get excited about things like pine cones, but if it's a rock or sticks like that are coming laterally and not dropping yeah. straight down. You might have something going on. <laughs> so take those hints. If they're if they're doing that, chances are they're trying to move you out of an area. And and again, with these things, it's always it's very psychological. They're they're mm -hmm. the, the way that it the prog the the encounters progress. It's just little things getting thrown. Like, hey, move along. Move along. This isn't where you need to be. This is our area. Well, and and you don't listen, and then it's bigger things, and then it's more noises and tree breaks, and you know, and, and whoops and knocks, and 
and they just screw with people's heads just with precision. It's just masterful. Well, didn't you notice in this last story even that the actions of the dog man encounter were very similar to the actions of Bigfoot. Yeah. Are there overlap in some of their like behaviors as far as what people say? A lot, uh, surprisingly. And that, and that's why I don't think, I don't think every Bigfoot encounter is a Bigfoot. And I don't think every dog man encounters a dog, dog man. I think that the, the, the consistencies are pretty, pretty solid on, on the way that they approach things. Although, the biggest difference is is that generally Bigfoot stay hidden, mm-hmm. but dogmen don't seem to have any problem just coming up and getting right in your grill. They know how intimidating they are. Oh, they gotta. I mean, they gotta. I think they, you know, animals can smell fear. You know, there's no surprise there. And everybody, don't do that. They'll smell fear. You know, I mean, that's an old saying, but I think there's there's truth to it. I don't think it's a scent. It might be a pheromone scent of some kind or, or something like that. But I think it's also that they're... Animals are just dialed into your energy. They know what you're doing. And uh, they can at least probably tell your, your, your basic intent. And so, you know, I think if, if what was I going with this? I, but the I think that the they, and, yeah. the, well, the dog man stuff is generally more confrontational. It seems to be a much more aggressive type of encounters. And you wouldn't really know it from reading the story that we just did, but a lot of times the dogman encounters are just like, you know, it just popped up and there it was and it just glared at me. And like it'll step out on a path and just stare and, you know, that you'll see that it's this, this, I don't know, walking dog or walking wolf and they're huge. So walking hyena. What did Philip say? Maybe they feed on human fear to live. I mean, if there is a spiritual aspect to it, I, I guess that's possible. That's a good point. Yeah, Rachel. That's, Rachel said she got pooped on by birds, but not do, uh, Bigfoot, which is good because <laughs> yeah. I think a Bigfoot turd might kill you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to wear special hats for that, Rachel. So good thing. <laughs> birds are pretty harmless. I think. They're, yeah. I've, I've been pooped on by a by a bird too, a few times in my youth. It's a worse feeling. There's a, some lady, there's a video out on the internet. Speaking of stupid, gross things, she's eating ice cream. Oh God! <laughs> Do you oh, know the video? Come on. Do you know the video? This familiar. This is this sounds familiar. Already. She's eating ice cream. It's vanilla ice cream, and she's like, she's and she spilled a little on her shirt, and she kind of mops that up, and then she looks on her arm, where a a a, a bird poop oh, just no. appeared, and she she goes like this and just slurps it up, and then she's like. <laughs> <laughs> the face, the face this woman makes is just everything. Like all of a sudden, the 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 tears of Jesus just come out of her eyes. She's like, "Oh no, I just ate a turd." Oh, oh God, it's just horrible. Sadness oh. and grief and disgust all at once on her face. And That's it's... why you eat chocolate ice cream, not vanilla. <laughs> That's why. How about just use a napkin? Just use a napkin. Don't go for the, I'm oh, just going to lick this I one would too. You would. That's the problem. Well, I would. Think about that in the future, Sheldon. I'm just saying. I'm I might to. have just saved you from eat, <laughs> eating a turd. This was a good omen. Maybe something <laughs> will happen soon. Yeah. I don't think it was salty. It was probably a, oh God. I don't care about the taste. Why are you talking about the taste? I don't care. Because <laughs> Barbara Moore said salty. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd be, sal- I'd be salty <laughs> if I was like, oh God. Then you see the ones that are, they like they would be sitting there on a park bench and just this white streak appears from their their forehead down to their chin. It's like, oh God, yeah, you can't wash that off. That memory is going to okay. be with you. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna I'm leaving now. If you're gonna continue, <laughs> I can't I can't do this conversation. <laughs> My empathy levels. I keep imagining it. <laughs> <laughs> the movie Step Brothers, where the, those those bully kids are. Pinning those adults down and making them lick white dog poop. Oh, I don't care. <laughs> that movie was so hilarious. Oh, it's uh, a great movie. Oh, yeah. Jesus. I'm sorry, folks. Sometimes I. It's time I, for bed, guys. He's I, tired. I, I That's what's happening. I'm getting punchy. Yeah, <laughs> it might be the case. I've been up since five this morning, so it's been a oh, long day. Tired. Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. it's been a long day, but it's been a good day. <laughs> like I said, the weather is beautiful, so. Um, but yeah, I guess we are, we're about out of time. So, and, uh, sorry to leave it on such a terrible note, (laughs) (laughs) note. Yeah. But 
where we all swallow spiders. Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I like On spiders. On average, yep, we all do. Yeah, that's the saying. When you're sleeping, they'll crawl right in and you'll just slurp them down. <laughs> Can you imagine swallowing a brown recluse and it doesn't like it? It it's bites like, you in the cheek? In, in the in tongue or something? Or something, oh, yeah. It's, it's just oh, like, oh, God. God. Why? 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 Do I don't you know. It just going? came to my Stop. head. This is this is the way it works in here, dude. It's not a happy place sometimes. You are Don today. <laughs> yeah, I'm like I'm like filling the Don void tonight. You are. <laughs> all right. Well, that's about all that we got time for. Sheldon, anything closing? Don't eat poop. That's and a good also, first. Yeah, we need that T-shirt to... in the store. Don't eat yeah, poop. Don't eat, don't eat poop. <laughs> Also, ParanormalPortal.net, if you guys want to visit the home base of the Paranormal Portal, you can even even set up your own interview if you have an amazing experience or maybe just just an experience in general. Feel free. Don't be afraid. Don't be um, afraid. Don't, don't be afraid. And also, just one more time, going to put in the Discord link right in the chat. There yes. We go. Excellent. Well, there you have it, folks. That is uh, that's the the path to happiness. Uh, paranormalportal.net is probably your best bet because all the social media is there linked and uh, as well as you know just a little information about the different shows and how you can get involved and uh, That's right. I don't know I, I just hope you guys spread the word please uh, you know let people know about the shows let them know what we're doing here if you enjoy them if you have a good time if you like kicking back and just shooting the breeze with us then please let people know uh, and please if you like the show hit the likes on the way out I'd appreciate yeah. that a bunch. That really goes a long way into helping to move the show into the algorithm and, and get recommended. Um, you know, every, every streaming service we go on has a different algorithm, but essentially interaction is a key for all of them. So if you guys are involved, that was totally gross. <laughs> uh, sorry, Maggie. Sorry. Um, but yeah, I just remember, we love you all. Be good, be kind, be nice. Take care of each other, help each other out. Find the magic in every day and remember to laugh as much as you can. And uh, I'll be back tomorrow night. Maybe Jimmy will be here with me, but I might be alone. But either way, you'll be with me, I hope. So remember, we do these live shows Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday night. I, I tried to do member shows on Thursday. I'm sorry I didn't do a member show yesterday, but I had a late interview that I had to accommodate for a, a group uh, of, of uh, some. Actually, they're into ITC. They're into instrumental transcommunication, so they're developing new platform. It's really exciting stuff, but I was doing that interview when I would have streamed last night. So if you're a member of the channel on YouTube, that's why I didn't do a live stream last night. I apologize, but it just kept getting moved back and moved back. I was playing it by ear, and, and so we got it done, but it'll be coming out. Also, um, if you are a listener of the podcast, the podcast is generally an audio-only platform. However... I've just recently started recording the podcast interviews and they have been released on rumble on, on YouTube on uh, BitChute, And so you can check them out there and it's the Par paranormal portal podcast video podcast is what it's called. And there's only one episode up so far on that playlist, but that was the interview I did with Mike Ricksecker and a uh, great guy. Uh, he's been on um, the learning or the Discovery Channel, several shows, Gaia TV. He's an author, a researcher, a filmmaker himself. And we had a phenomenal discussion talking about time and uh, several other things in the paranormal. So if you haven't checked out that episode, please check it out. It really was amazing. So is that Ooh. the ghost voices? Is that for ghost voices? Yes, it is. It's called Staticom. I'll just give you a little uh, teaser uh, is their new platform that they're developing. And uh, it looks pretty exciting. And it's not available for sale, but they are a research group that are developing this. And it could possibly be someday. So keep your eyes peeled for that, but it should be a, a good good interview. I, I enjoyed talking to them a lot. It was a lot of fun. So I, um, that'll be coming out. This this next episode of the podcast coming out on on Monday will be the interview I had with uh, Dave Schrader of uh, darkness radio and the paranormal 60 podcast. And Dave's a great guy. He's been, uh, he's been, he's been at this for decades and just an incredibly knowledgeable and insightful guy. So the Dave Schrader interview will be coming out on Monday. Then we've got a, uh, I think, well, anyway, we're, we're doing a whole bunch of interviews. So that's the nutshell. But anyway, guys, that's it for us tonight. 
Thank you so much for tuning in and being a part of the journey. Uh, again, please spread the word. Let other people know what we're doing. Please post it online. Feel free to share these episodes wherever you want. Uh, it would help us out a ton. This is all grassroots, and you guys are the grassroots. So um, you guys are making these shows bigger uh, all the time, and thank you for that. So thank you for your love and support. We'll see you tomorrow night, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 10 p.m. Eastern, right here, wherever you're watching, and uh, look forward to the next one. Until next time, guys, good night. Good night.